It was the summer travel season in Europe. On the Greek island of Crete, 143 passengers and 8 crew boarded Happy Lloyd Flight 3378, bound for Hanover in Germany. Most of the passengers were German holidaymakers, returning home after enjoying the sunshine and beaches the small island is famous for. No one on board knows it yet, but in a few minutes, the captain would make a series of faulty assumptions which would ensure that they would not make it to Hanover that day. For years, investigators and the courts would argue over the causes of this accident and the role that the flight crew played in it. What follows is the curious case of Happy Lloyd Flight 3378, the flight where a few false assumptions nearly led to disaster. At shortly before 11am local time, the Airbus A310, carrying 152 people, pushed back from the gate at Hanya for its three and a half hour journey to Hanover in Germany. In command of the wide-body jet was Captain Wolfgang Arminger. He was 56 years old and had amassed over 23,000 hours of flying experience, the most of any pilot at Happy Lloyd. He was by far the more senior of the two-man crew. The first officer, identified in the accident's final report as Thornston Orr, was new to the company. He had been flying for just four years and had only a few hundred hours on the A310. The Airbus A310 was a marvel of engineering when it was released in 1983, being one of the first aircraft to be operated with a crew of two. By the year 2000, however, it was already being phased out of service by most passenger airlines, in favour of the more modern and fuel-efficient A330. Happy Lloyd had a total of seven A310s in their fleet. Just after 11am local time, the pilots turned onto the runway and started their takeoff roll. Mere seconds after getting airborne, however, the crew encountered a problem. When they put the landing gear lever in the up position, they received a number of warnings, indicating that the gear was not retracting. They tried moving the gear lever up and down a number of times, but this didn't fix the issue. While unusual, this was not an emergency situation. An aircraft is perfectly capable of flying with its wheels extended. There would be nothing preventing the crew from safely continuing their flight all the way to Hanover like this. Except, there was one thing. The gear created a lot of drag when they are extended. This air resistance means that the engines have to work a lot harder, which increases fuel burn dramatically. The pilots now had to find out whether they would make it to Hanover, or whether they would have to land somewhere further south. The captain instructed the first officer to contact the company dispatcher and ask for advice on the best course of action. Normally, this conversation would have taken only minutes. However, the first officer discovered that the long-distance radio at Happy Lloyd's dispatch office was not working. As such, he had to resort to communicating with dispatch via a rudimentary text messaging system known as ACARS, or Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System. This painstaking back and forth between the first officer and the company dispatch took almost an hour. Meanwhile, the captain went about calculating the amount of fuel he would be landing with. To do this, he used his flight management computer, which is a mirror of the computer the first officer was using to communicate with dispatch. This computer inputs a number of variables, including the winds, aircraft speed, weight, and cruise altitude, among others, into an algorithm to determine fuel consumption. From this, it is able to produce an estimate of the fuel on board at the destination, known as EFOB, or Estimated Fuel on Board. By examining the flight management computer, the captain was quickly able to see that they would not have enough fuel to reach Hanover. He informed the first officer of this, who relayed this to the dispatcher. The dispatcher suggested that the crew attempt to land at Stuttgart, in the south of Germany, However, the crew believed that this was likely still too far away, and instead proposed Munich. This was agreed upon, and the dispatchers said that if at some point Munich became unreachable, they should divert to Vienna in Austria. At this point, things were looking up. The plan was to land at Munich, and then to put the passengers on another flight to Hanover, perhaps a few short hours behind schedule, while the aircraft got fixed. The plane continued climbing to its cruising altitude of 31,000 feet, and the crew began plotting their fuel consumption in more detail. The first officer took out the flight manual and opened it to a section on extended flight with the landing gear down. In this section was a chart, which provided fuel consumption figures for various altitudes with the gear extended. The figures in this chart extended up to 27,000 feet, but the crew had already reached their cruising altitude of 31,000 feet. The captain figured that the chart only went up to 27,000 feet because it was meant for flight planning, but not for in-flight fuel calculations. He thought that it would be better to trust the flight management computer for this, so they put the manual away. Neither pilot realised it yet, but this assumption that the flight management computer could calculate fuel burn with the wheels down was not correct. Unlike the fuel consumption calculator in a car, which extrapolates current fuel consumption out into the future, the flight management system of the A310 used an algorithm to calculate fuel. This algorithm used factors like the aircraft's altitude and the direction and speed of the wind to calculate fuel consumption, and thus to estimate the fuel on board at any given point along the plane's route, including the destination. Critically, this algorithm did not take into account whether the landing gear was down, 
This meant that the computer had no idea how quickly the aircraft was burning fuel. It assumed that the landing gear was up and that the flight was more or less normal. As such, it produced grossly inflated figures for the estimated fuel on board at Munich. It simply took the current fuel on board, fed it through the algorithm, which was designed for a basically normal flight, and provided a fuel estimate to the pilots. During their first conversation with the dispatcher, the pilots each checked their own flight management computers that they would have enough fuel to reach Munich. They both came up with an estimated figure of 3.3 tonnes at Munich, which was well above the legal minimum. However, the first sign of trouble came at just before noon, when the first officer carried out a routine fuel check. He found that they had used 60% more fuel than expected for this portion of the flight. The extended landing gear had increased their fuel consumption drastically. Somehow, it didn't dawn on the pilots that this would make it impossible for them to fly all the way to Munich, which was more than 60% of the distance between Hanya and Hanover. They rationalised their decision to continue to Munich with the argument that the climb phase of the flight, which they had just completed, always burns more fuel than the cruise and descent. Because of this assumption, they failed to properly investigate the discrepancy between their own calculations and the high estimated fuel on board figure generated by the flight management computer. As the crew continued on the way across southern Europe, the estimated fuel on board at Munich began to drop. Initially, the computer had estimated that they would have 3.3 tonnes on board upon reaching Munich, but this had now dropped to 2 tonnes. The algorithm for calculating fuel was operating as normal, but the estimated fuel at the destination kept dropping because the aircraft's current fuel level, which was constantly being fed into the algorithm, was decreasing much faster than normal. The legal minimum fuel on board required for landing was 1.9 tonnes, and Captain Arminger was now just within 100 kilograms of breaching that limit. At this point, he decided to divert to Vienna, which was much closer to their current position. When he input this destination into his flight management computer, it estimated that there would be 2.6 tonnes of fuel left when they reached Vienna. This was enough, but just to err on the safe side, Arminger started requesting shortcuts from air traffic control, so that they would arrive at Vienna with a larger buffer of fuel. While this was a prudent decision, it had an unexpected negative side effect. As the flight progressed, the shortcuts received from air traffic control meant that the estimated fuel on board at Vienna stayed at 2.6 tonnes. If this had been a normal flight, receiving shortcuts en route would have increased the estimated fuel on board at the destination. The fact that the estimated fuel on board of Vienna stayed the same even though the route to Vienna was getting shorter meant that the flight was burning fuel more quickly than predicted. The crew should have been alert to this, especially given how the estimated fuel on board had dropped constantly as they made their way to Munich initially. Around this time, the aircraft passed just to the east of Zagreb. They could easily have landed here and brought an end to the whole situation. But Captain Arminger decided to press on towards Vienna, where he knew Hapig Lloyd had a presence, and where he could more easily get the aircraft fixed. He had been with the company for decades, and he was keenly aware of the commercial pressure to minimise delays in maintenance and cost to the airline in transferring passengers. As the route to Vienna was more or less straight from this point, they could no longer avail of any more shortcuts. This meant that, finally, the reality of their fuel situation could no longer be hidden. The estimated fuel on board of Vienna now began to drop, and by half twelve it had fallen below 1.9 tonnes, the legal minimum required for landing. From this point on, the urgency of the crew's situation began to increase rapidly. The captain called Vienna Air Traffic Control on the radio and asked for permission to fly straight into runway 34 at Vienna, which was more or less aligned with their flight path. This request was granted, and the captain then asked permission for a priority landing, which he also received. The first officer pressed him to declare a fuel emergency, which he was required to do given that the landing fuel had dropped below the legally allowed minimum. However, the captain refused to do this. He figured that there would be no point in bringing negative press to himself or to the airline by declaring a fuel emergency when they were so clearly going to make it to Vienna anyway. All would be right in a few minutes, he had convinced himself. This illusion was shattered at one minute past twelve, however, when the low fuel light illuminated in the cockpit. Six minutes after this, the captain gave in and declared a fuel emergency. Bizarrely, however, in his emergency call to air traffic control, he told them that they would reach Vienna safely and that there was no need to send the emergency vehicles to the aircraft. He was so eager not to have a fuss made about the situation that he treated the emergency call as a mere formality. Despite the ever-worsening fuel situation, the crew still had a number of options open to them which would have assured a safe landing. First, they could have stayed at cruise altitude where fuel consumption was lower, and then basically glided down to Vienna once they were close enough with the engines idling. Instead of this, they began their descent a whole 267 kilometers from the airport. This meant that the engines were still operating at a relatively high thrust setting throughout the slow descent. An even better option to salvage the situation was suggested by the first officer at 9 minutes past 12. He said that they should fly to Graz, which was 55 kilometers closer to them than Vienna. The captain disagreed, saying that they were already lined up with the runway at Vienna, and that turning towards Graz might cost them more fuel than continuing on to Vienna. 
This was a poor reason not to go to Graz. There was no way that the route there would end up longer than the 55 kilometers that the diversion would save them. Nonetheless, the two pilots assessed the possibility of going to Graz, but when they couldn't find the approach charts for the airport, they decided to proceed on to Vienna. It was an airport they were at least familiar with. As the aircraft continued its straight-in approach to Vienna, the estimated fuel on board at Vienna continued to fall. This alarmed the captain, and for the first time, he asked out loud whether the flight management computer actually factored in the air resistance from the gear in its calculations. The first officer correctly responded that no, it must not factor this in, as that would explain why it had to keep readjusting its figures downwards. Arminger was simply unwilling to consider this possibility, however, and the first officer reluctantly let the issue go. This decision not to do an objective analysis of the situation because the potential answer is undesirable could be likened to the decision not to take out car insurance because the thought of getting into an accident is just too awful to consider it. The awfulness of a potential bad outcome is the very reason to objectively analyse a risk, not a reason not to. Minutes later, at 26 minutes past 12, and still 22 kilometres from the airport, the right-hand engine ran out of fuel. Seconds later, the left-hand engine flamed out. The plane was now nothing more than a giant glider, without electrical power, drifting steadily towards the ground. The captain deployed a small fan from the underside of the aircraft, known as the ram air turbine, in order to generate the small amount of electricity needed to power his flight instruments and the hydraulic pumps that operate the flight controls. The first officer issued a mayday call to air traffic control, and began a desperate last-ditch attempt to restart the engines with whatever fuel was left. At first he was successful. He managed to start up both engines with the tiny amount of fuel left in the tanks. However, this only lasted two minutes. The engines soon flamed out again, and there was no fuel left to burn. At their rate of descent, there was no way the captain could stretch the glide to the runway. He tried his best to minimise the impact forces, but at half twelve, the aircraft smashed down into a field 660 metres short of the runway, left wing tip and landing gear first. The left landing gear assembly was torn off, and the aircraft started sliding sideways through the field, its left engine scraping along the ground. It ploughed through the approach lights and an ILS antenna, and then slid across a taxiway before finally coming to rest. The aircraft had just about made it to Vienna. Captain Arminger gave the order to evacuate as soon as the aircraft came to a stop, and the flight attendants began leading the passengers to the exits. Though all 143 passengers had survived the crash pretty much unscathed, the evacuation ended up being a bit of a mess. The flight attendants were unable to open the front left-hand door because of the angle the aircraft was resting at, and the front right-hand door was too high off the ground to be usable as an escape. The two centre slides were also unusable. The one on the left had been pierced by a piece of wreckage and had deflated, while the one on the right was blown on top of the fuselage by the wind. This just left the two aft exits, and this is where all of the passengers were eventually able to escape from. Luckily, there was no fuel left to start a fire. In all, 26 passengers received minor injuries in the evacuation, with the rest escaping entirely unscathed. The aircraft itself was so damaged, however, that it was written off. The captain initially received a hero's welcome from the media, but the tide of public opinion changed rapidly when Austrian investigators probed the black boxes and found that, contrary to what the captain had reported, the plane did not suffer a sudden loss of fuel on short final at Vienna, but rather had been steadily losing fuel for the entirety of the flight. As for what caused the gear trouble to begin with, Investigators found that a nut in the right main landing gear actuator had been installed incorrectly, which had mechanically prevented the retraction of the landing gear. The main focus of the investigation then turned to why the pilots were so convinced that the flight management computer could be used to estimate the fuel on board at their destination. They found that the training the pilots had received on the flight management computer was quite limited. They had learned to use the machine for a defined set of circumstances, and had not been taught about its underlying logic. As such, they had no idea that the computer used an algorithm to calculate fuel usage, rather than projecting current fuel use into the future. The captain would go on to say to the media that, quote, I assume that the flight management system works like an onboard computer in a car, which also shows the range correctly even if you have a roof rack with you. Compounding this problem was the fact that none of the manuals on board the plane listed the factors which the computer used to calculate fuel consumption. If the pilots had access to these, they would quickly have discovered that air resistance from the landing gear did not factor into the calculations. There was another issue still. The checklist for flight with the gear down created by Airbus had included a step to check the fuel manually. However, this step was missing from the checklist which Hapag Lloyd had provided to the pilots. All of these factors meant that the assumption made by the captain early on in the flight that the estimated fuel on board at the destination was taking into account the position of the gear was never challenged. This assumption wasn't brought into question because the numerous shortcuts received by the crew en route meant that this figure stayed constant throughout the flight to Vienna up until the final few minutes. Investigators still wanted to know why, when it finally became clear that the aircraft was in a low fuel emergency, 
the captain still pressed on to Vienna. Why didn't he divert to Zagreb or Graz when he had the chance? They explained this with reference to a psychological phenomenon known as subjectively expected utility. In other words, subconsciously, the captain multiplied the odds of landing in Vienna, which he figured were about 100%, by how good it would be to land in Vienna, which is, let's say, 10 out of 10. He then compared this to the chances of making it to Zagreb, which was also 100%, but it was not as good as making it to Vienna, so it got a mental score of, let's say, 5 out of 10. In the captain's mind, the decision was clear. Going to Vienna was the right move. It had higher subjectively expected utility. At no point did the captain carry out an objective analysis of the true chances of making it to Vienna. Again, investigators identified the role of another psychological phenomenon here. This is known as plan continuation bias, which is pretty self-explanatory. With all of the stress he was under, and the high workload during these final few minutes of the flight, Captain Arminger's familiarity with the existing plan, however objectively unachievable it was, was worth more to him than any unfamiliar alternative plan, however superior it might in fact be. The captain's given reason that Graz was an unsafe bet, that they didn't have the approach charts, was, objectively speaking, not sufficient. The weather was clear, and they could easily have seen the runway from far out and made an approach. The captain's inflexible and narrow approach to this problem, and his fixation on getting to Vienna, meant that when the first officer pointed out the very real possibility that the fuel figures being produced by the flight management computer did not take the landing gear into account, he dismissed this out of hand. He wasn't willing to consider any information that might put a stop to the plan he had already set in motion. This wasn't a simple case of an arrogant captain being sure that he knows best. Really, it was the case of a normal human being under an immense amount of pressure succumbing to a range of psychological biases as his options grew ever narrower. This is not to completely exculpate the captain either. The investigators noted that the first officer's approach to the problem was exemplary throughout the flight. They noted that he went above and beyond the call of duty, staying open-minded and continuously re-evaluating the situation. He continuously suggested alternatives to the captain, many of which, if followed, would have led to a very different outcome. Had the captain shared this open-mindedness and mental flexibility, the plane might not have ended up crash landing in Vienna. There was one more thing which could have led to a different outcome. When both of the engines flamed out on final approach, the crew failed to follow the dual engine flame-out checklist. The second last item on this checklist was the pressing of the land recovery switch, which would have provided emergency power to the flaps and slats. Investigators determined that had the crew deployed the flaps and slats, this would have provided enough lift to enable them to reach the runway. This would have led to a much softer and more controlled landing, which would have injured fewer passengers and likely saved the multi-million euro aircraft from being written off. In the end, it was miraculous that this incident ended as well as it did. Because of this accident, crew resource management is now a more prominent component of flight training and a collaborative and cautious approach to problem solving is encouraged to a much greater degree. Pilots are also provided with more complete manuals and are trained with a greater understanding of how their flight computers operate. Airbus has now updated the checklist for when the gear doesn't retract and advises pilots to multiply the fuel consumption figures by 2.4 and to disregard the calculations of the flight management computer. It's worth reflecting on how fortunate it is that this time, these lessons were learned without any loss of life. Special thanks to the members of this channel for helping make this video possible. I'd especially like to thank users EUK95 and Andrew Shaiskilov for their extremely generous contributions. If you'd like to support the channel and get perks like early access to videos or voting on future episodes, please click the join button. I've also started a Patreon, which is linked here. Thanks again for watching.